Hi, welcome everyone um, to the afternoon plenary. I hope everyone's been having a great time at NAM. I'm Dave Sang. I'm a lecturer at the University of Bath and a member of the local organizing committee for NAM. You may recognize me from such shows as rushing into your sessions to provide tech support and then running away. Um, but today, it's my privilege to introduce this afternoon's plenary speaker, Professor Vicki Caspi. She's a distinguished astronomer and Lauren Trottier Professor of Astrophysics at uh, McGill University, as well as the director of the McGill Space Institute. Among her many honors, she is a companion of the Order of Canada, a fellow of the American uh, Arts and uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, the uh, American Physical Society, as well as the Royal Society. And she was recently a recipient of the Picarian Medal from the Royal Society, as well as the most recent recipient of the prestigious Shaw Prize, along with Chris uh, Kobiliotu uh, for their work in the study of magnetars. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Vicky when I was a postdoc at McGill, and she's one of the best mentors and scientific leaders I've ever met. And while Vicky is best known for her work in understanding neutron stars and pulsars, and magnetars in particular, she has recently pivoted to help lead the fast radio burst revolution with her work in CHIME, or with CHIME, the Canadian High-Intensity in, high Mapping Experiment. Um, though my bet is that they'll probably turn out to be magnetars as well. Um, so uh, with all that, I'm done embarrassing Vicky, so I'll hand over to her and she can tell us about the exciting new world of FRBs. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, can you all see my top slide with the title, Fast Radio Burst or Why I Finally Left the Galaxy? You can, hello, can you all see it? Yes, we yes. can see it. Okay, excellent, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to tell you about this uh, new phenomenon called fast radio bursts. Uh, when people ask me these days, what are you working on? I often say, I don't, I don't know, because we really don't know what these things are. Uh, lot, there's lots of suspicions, and, and you'll hear a little bit about magnetars in this, in this talk. Uh, but the bottom line is we're still, we're still not quite sure um, what's causing this phenomenon. But um, before talking about FRBs, I want to just um, talk a little bit about the galactic astronomy, the sort of research I used to do uh, back when I lived in the galaxy, uh, because it's really relevant to understanding uh, the FRB mystery. Um, so first of all, I just want to remind um, uh, all of you, of course, uh, many of you are, are quite familiar with this subject. Uh, radio pulsars, of course, were... Um, discovered by a telescope in the UK by uh, Jocelyn um, Bell Burnell. Uh, but radio pulsars are rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars. And, um, you know, you can see uh, that basically misalignment between the spin axis and a magnetic axis that causes a pulse of, of uh, radio waves typically uh, once per rotation period. And the radio waves here are powered by the loss of rotational kinetic energy of the star. So the star ha is spinning from its uh, birth in a supernova. Uh, it's born with some spin and then it slows down due to magnetic braking. So they're highly magnetized. When you spin a magnet, they tend to slow down and they produce this radio emission. They also produce emission across the electromagnetic spectrum, but they're most easily, typically, they're most easily observed in the radio band. And you can see, we, did, we all observe them with this, this is the, with many different radio telescopes on Earth, but so one of them is this uh, large radio telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, 100 meter aperture. And uh, that's where actually we took the data. Of, of, this is an incredibly bright pulsar. You, you can see each of these individual pulses. But in fact, this data has already been modify to correct for interstellar dispersion because radio waves, when they propagate through plasma, get dispersed. And this is really the way pulses arrive um, from a pulsar. This is now on the, on the, pl the plot on the, on the left is you have phase, pulse phase, um, or you could think of it as time on the x-axis and radio frequency on the y-axis, you see in here, we're sensitive over about 30 megahertz of bandwidth. And you see that the 
lowest radio frequencies tend to arrive first. And in fact, the delay over this bandwidth um, is such that it wraps around so that because we've plotted in pulse phase, the delay is more than a pulse, is more than several pulse periods for this particular pulsar. So what's happening here is that the um, radio waves are being dispersed by free electrons and the degree of dispersion is proportional. We, with the degree of dispersion, we call it the dispersion measure. And that's proportional to the integrated electron density along the line of sight. So the further you are away, typically, uh, the greater, the, the more integrated column depth of free electrons you've gone through and the greater the dispersion. And so the time delay between the arrival times at any two different radio frequencies, F1 and F2, is proportional to that dispersion measure. And it's actually a one over F squared law. So in fact, this might look, look like lines of dispersion, but they're really, it's really parabolic. So the, 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 the lowest radio frequencies arrive the latest because of this interstellar dispersion effect. Now, we know this, um, pulsars have allowed, to study, allowed us to study this in the galaxy really well. Um, we know of you know, over 2,500 radio pulsars in the galaxy. Some of them have independent distance estimates. They're associated with a supernova remnant or they're in a binary with another star whose distance is known or they're in a globular cluster. There's lots of ways of independently knowing pulsar distances. And so we have a model for the distribution of free electrons in the galaxy. So, you know, Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. Of course, it's, it's not this spiral galaxy because you can't take a picture of the outside of your home when you're in it. But it, it, picturing looking down on the Milky Way galaxy, this is our best or one of our best models for the galactic electron distribution. And it's displayed here as a contour plot. So the galactic center is where the plus sign is and Pac-Man here is Earth. And you can see some, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, spiral arms, schematic spiral arms. And the contours are lines of constant dispersion measure uh, in, in dispersion measure units. So that in any direction, if you've detected some radio pulsar and you've measured the dispersion measure by measuring the delay between two different frequencies and the arrival times of the pulses, then you know, roughly speaking, the distance. So if you're in this direction, if you measure a DM of 200, it's, it's about so far away. And this model is three-dimensional. So this is just a slice through three-dimensional model, but in any direction, you can know the distance to a pulsar by measuring its dispersion measure, thanks to this model. And what you also have from this model is a maximum dispersion measure that the galaxy can provide along any line of sight. Because in any direction, eventually the galaxy runs out of electrons. You run and reach the edges of the galaxy. And so we also know from this model, which is quite well calibrated using known radio pulsars that have independent distance, distance estimates. So the model's fairly well calibrated. We know in any direction on the sky what the maximum dispersion measure that you can have due to the Milky Way galaxy is. And that's very important for the talk as I get to fast radio bursts. But first, a little bit more about pulsars. Um, so they're called rotation power pulsars because they're powered by the rate of the loss of rotational kinetic energy. And so their spin periods increase over time because they're slowing down. So they have a P dot, where that's a time derivative and the time derivative is positive. And so you can express the period at any time as some initial period at some epoch plus the slope times time. And that P dot is really useful. It's really easy to measure for pulsars. It's you measure it, you know, even for some pulsars after a few days of observing them, you can tell. And the P dot and the P together tell you so much about radio pulsars. For one thing, they tell you the rotational, rotational kinetic energy loss rate, or in other words, the ultimate source of power for radio pulsars. That's given by the time derivative of the rotational kinetic energy where I is a moment of inertia and omega is an angular velocity. And you can express that in terms of P and P dot. And we call that the spin down luminosity. And that's, that's the ultimate source of power in these, in these objects. 
This is also a measure of age, P over 2P dot, that two is there for arcane reasons. You can also estimate the magnetic field because we said that they slow down due to magnetic breaking. And if you assume magnetic dipole breaking in a vacuum, this is the relation between the inferred surface dipolar magnetic field and the period and period derivative. So just from measuring P and P dot, you can know so much about a radio pulsar. And just some fiducial numbers. Um, the maximum spin down luminosity we know of for any pulsar in our galaxy is the crab pulsar, is from the crab pulsar, which is uh, just about five times 10 to the 38 ergs per second. That's the most powerful pulsar we know of in the galaxy. Uh, so just note that number 10 to the 38 ergs per second. And the strongest magnetic fields we know of for radio pulsars are a few times 10 to the 13 Gauss. So that's, that's pretty powerful, that's pretty impressive. But in fact, we know of some neutron stars with even higher fields, and I'm gonna come to that shortly. In fact, here I am, the there are neutron stars that have much higher magnetic fields than the radio pulsars I've been discussing. And those are called the magnetars. Magnetars are these ultra highly magnetized young neutron stars. Uh, they are quite young, typically uh, ages under 10,000 years. They have fields upwards of 10 to the 14 Gauss on their surfaces, uh, some even higher 10 to the 15 Gauss. They probably have much higher fields in their interiors. And uh, they are copious X-ray emitters. Their X-ray luminosity is actually much greater than their spin down luminosity. So in radio pulsars, I told you that all the radio emission is powered by the rate of loss of rotational kinetic energy or that spin down luminosity. In magnetars, that's, that's not true. There certainly is spin down luminosity. There's just certainly magnetic breaking. But what we observe from the pulsar, the X-rays um, and the copious X-ray bursts that you're seeing in this cartoon, we observe this ubiquitously from magnetars. All of that is um, powered by a magnetic energy reservoir, not the rotational kinetic energy reservoir, but the magnetic energy reservoir, which is you know, on the order of 10 to the 47 to 10 to the 49 ergs. So you have a lot of power stored up inside the neutron star, maybe even more, which causes the fields to be unstable. And that's why you get these massive explosions. These are much rarer. We only know of a couple dozen in the Milky Way galaxy, and they're all and they're all in the disk, very closely tight with star with with um, star formation, uh, very close to the disk of the galaxy. They're very young neutron stars. Um, of the couple dozen, uh, roughly speaking, six have shown radio emission. So most of them don't show any radio emission whatsoever, and they've been searched. Um, and the radio emission is pretty faint, about ten to the thirty-one ergs per second. Remember, Crab was ten to the 38 per ergs per second. It's radio emission is a little fainter, but not much fainter. So these are not much radio emission, at least not historically. I will update this number later. Um, magnetars also have giant flares, uh, really titanic explosions, unpredictable uh, in X-rays and soft gamma rays. And in fact, one of these giant flares, the 2004 flare from the soft gamma repeater, they're also called soft gamma repeaters, 1806 minus 20, you can see it here in counts per second as a function of time, uh, where it actually saturated the gamma ray detectors. We don't really know how bright it got. It was so powerful. It was the most intense cosmic transient or solar flare ever observed. The luminosity uh, inferred for it was about 10 to the 47 ergs per second. Uh, that's about um, the same amount of energy released in 200 milliseconds as the sun releases in uh, 250,000 years. And this solar, this, this huge giant flare was not detected in radio waves. It so happened radio telescope was observing it and uh, there was no, no hint of it. Okay. So that's your whirlwind introduction to radio pulsars and magnetars. And what I've tried to do is highlight all the key points that are relevant for where I'm going next, which is outside of the galaxy. So after studying galactic radio pulsars and magnetars for 20 years, I felt it was time to leave the galaxy. And what made me leave? This bizarre burst, this single burst, 
So this is not a train of pulses like in radio pulsars, a single solitary radio burst, which we refer to as the Lorimer burst. Uh, this was published, uh, actually, I think that date is wrong. It should be 2007, sorry about that. Uh, this is now, again, radio frequency on the y-axis. This time it's between 1.2 and 1.5 gigahertz. And this is time on the x-axis. And this is about 500 milliseconds or half a second of time. And you can see the telltale sweep, the, the classic dispersion smearing with the you know, parabolic shape. Uh, this horizontal line is just some terrestrial uh, antenna, some, some interference. And when you de-disperse this, that is you correct in software for the dispersion, you get the inset, which is no signal whatsoever or just consistent with radiometer noise. Suddenly the burst, and then radiometer noise, and, and it goes away and never comes back. And that's what was referred to as the Lorimer burst. And you might say, well, perhaps that was just one particularly bright burst from some radio pulsar. And by the way, this was de detected with the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. Um, but what was astonishing about the Lorimer burst is that the, dis the measured dispersion measure of the burst was 375 parsecs per cubic centimeter. Those are crazy uh, dispersion measure units. But from what we know about the galaxy, and I've now shown you the model, and I've explained to you how the model's calibrated and that it's quite reliable, the maximum dispersion measure due to the Milky Way galaxy along the line of sight where the Lorimer burst was detected was only 25 in the same units. So the observed dispersion measure of this burst was way brighter, sorry, way larger than anything the galaxy could provide. And people, and there's no evidence for any sort of, you know, H2 regions or any, any stuff in the way that could account for so massive an amount of dispersion. So this was very exciting and it naively implied a cosmological distance for this burst. You know, previously all the radio pulsars known were in the galaxy or maybe in the large, large Magellanic and small Magellanic clouds. But this was something else. This was, oh my goodness, this DM, how could that be? Because once it implies a cosmological distance, it also implies a tremendous luminosity. It's so far away and yet we can detect it so brightly. Now, how, you know, let's talk, let's break that down a little bit more. A cosmological distance, this was shocking for a radio burst. It had never been seen before. Models for the intergalactic medium, they say there could be free electrons in there, but they'd be quite tenuous compared to what's in the interstellar medium of a spiral galaxy. And models had predicted that the dispersion measure due to the intergalactic medium would be, roughly speaking, 1,200 times redshift. Here, Z is redshift. And so... If you plug in Z equals 0.3 for the Lorimer burst, I'm uh, sorry, if you, if you plug in the dispersion measure of the Lorimer burst and solve for redshift, sorry, I said that wrong, uh, you get about 0.3 for the redshift, which corresponds to a gigaparsec, and that's pretty far. But likely that is an upper limit because some of the dispersion measure must be uh, in some host galaxy, or it's probably in a host galaxy, presumably. Um, just hang on just one second. Someone just came in my door and it's a little freaking me out. So hang on. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so the total dispersion measure is going to be the sum of many different terms. Um, one, of course, from the interstellar medium in the Milky Way. One from any sort of free electron halo in the Milky Way or surrounding the Milky Way. One from the intergalactic medium, according to some law where it scales roughly speaking with distance. And then some, some contribution from the host. Um, and so let's say you take the total you measure for the Lorimer burst and you subtract off Milky Way contribution, you subtract off the halo, contribution, which you can estimate from models. We don't really know what the halo model, what the halo is. Uh, and then you divide the rest, half in the IGM and half in the host. 
still, you know, that gives you about 500 megaparsecs, pretty large. And that implies an energy range of 10 to the 40 ergs or a luminosity of 10 to the 43 ergs per second, which is still, you know, pretty powerful. Now you might say, why don't you just go and look where is the FRB? We would love to be able to identify a host galaxy. Then you could determine the redshift. You could set the energy scale. You could know what type of galaxy. But unfortunately, with parks, the uncertainty region is extremely large, and uh, there's you know literally hundreds of galaxies there. Um, now you could try going to a different telescope and find fast radio bursts like the Arecibo. Well, you're not going to do that anymore, but um, you could have. The point is, a larger aperture it can help, uh, but not sufficiently to identify a. Uh, uh, a, um, the host galaxy, which you really need. Um, yeah, so there's many, many host galaxies uh, or potential galaxies in the error region. What you really need is an interferometer, but the problem is interferometers have tiny fields of view. So if it's a transient phenomenon, um, it's hard to find these things. Uh, so what can pinpoint is, doesn't do a good job at finding them. What can find them doesn't good do a good job at pinpointing them. So it's a problem. Now we've discovered a, a number more FRBs um, it, it following that. As of 2017, only about two dozen were detected. Um, all of them consist of few millisecond bursts of uh, radio waves. And, uh, but from the two dozen that were detected as of 2017, the inferred all sky rate was about a thousand per sky per day. So you can extrapolate from the field of view of the telescope, how long the telescope was observing to detect the number. And that's where you, you, you extrapolate and you infer that this is not an uncommon phenomenon. A thousand per sky per day. This is something ubiquitous that really it's only modern computer technology that's allowed us to suddenly see. They're coming from all directions in the sky. Most are single peaks, some have multi-peak complex morphologies. You can see this one here actually has an interesting scattering tail. You see uh, that this is from multi-path scattering. It's a phenomenon that's observed ubiquitously for radio pulsars in the galaxy where uh, you have a narrow emitted pulse, but then it gets broadened due to multi-path scattering. Some of them repeat now, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, and the inferred luminosities of detected sources, if you, if you take their uh, dispersion measures as distance proxies, gives you somewhere between 10 to the 35, 10 to the 43 ergs. Um, and you can see these references for some recent reviews. Now, just to talk a little bit, what, what could these things be? First of all, for several years, there were more models than there were events observed. Um, the the fact that they only last a few milliseconds already tells you that it has to be fairly compact from light travel time arguments. So uh, for a millisecond, you know, it has to be less than about 300 kilometers in size, which implies a compact object. Um, on the other hand, the energy, as I said, they're really bright, but the energy is not that constraining. Gamma ray bursts have isotropic energies of much, much higher, 10 to 53 ergs. And by the way, so far, we haven't seen any gamma ray burst FRB coincidences, although there's have students working on that right now. Um, the radiation mechanism must be coherent because the brightness temperature, uh, given the compact nature of the source, is, is ridiculous. It's, you know, 10 to the 34. Kelvin, the same sort of arguments held for radio pulsars, and this sort of makes it smell like strong magnetic fields um, must be involved. Uh, you know, those, it must be a non-thermal process. For fast radio bursts, yes, there's easily enough energy in cataclysmic events like supernovae. Um, but it, it's hard, uh, and I've told you some of them repeat, so that makes it hard to be a supernova, but for those that don't repeat, still the free, free opacity at, super, during, at the time of the supernova um, is really high, and it's hard to get the radio waves out if this was the mechanism. Uh, could you have merging compact objects, neutron star black hole, or neutron star neutron star mergers? Um, well, sure. That, that's, that's certainly enough energy there, but you know we see a, see a thousand per sky per day. <laughs> that's not the rate uh, observed of these objects. Uh, the rate is too low. And you know when I say a thousand per sky per day, that's above some radio flux limit. It's probably much higher than that. And some repeats. You know you can't merge the neutron stars over and over and over again. 
And you can see this um, online FRB theory wiki for, for more um, theoretical models. And I'll just talk briefly about this repeater. The first repeater we found was using the now defunct 300 meter Arecibo Observatory. Uh, it was the first non-parks FRB and you can see the telltale dispersion sweep and the de-dispersed inset here. Uh, the, D, the, the, the DM was about 558 parsecs per centimeter cube, three times the maximum. We saw a rather unusual spectrum in this source. We, we thought that was quite odd. Why should the spectrum be so bright at high radio frequency and fade away at low? Um, that's not typical of radio sources that we know of. And we assumed at the time that it was due to an off, offset from the beam center that there is phase space where a flat spectrum source, if you offset it, could have, be observed to have a spectrum like that. Um, but then after observing for months and months and months, uh, FRB 12.1102 was found to repeat. And in, we, we stared at it for months and saw nothing. And then one time it was actually a student, Paul Schultz, was, you know, could, he was incredibly diligent and he kept analyzing all this data where we thought we would see nothing. And then suddenly the 10 bursts in an hour from the same source at the same dispersion measure, at the same position on the sky, uh, it instantly ruled out cataclysmic models for this source. And moreover, what was astonishing, here we're showing the de-dispersed pulses, but you see sometimes they're incredibly bright from the source. Sometimes they're multi-peaked. Uh, sometimes they're very faint. Uh, it, 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 these two bursts were just a few seconds apart, and yet the spectra are radically different. This one's really bright at high radio frequencies. This one's brighter at low radio frequencies. That had nothing to do with the beam. It's the source itself whose spectrum is changing radically burst to burst. That was pretty shocking to us. We also found that the bursts clustered in time. We, we would go for months without seeing anything and then suddenly see lots of bursts, and it was clearly non-Poissonian. So this opened up all sorts of questions. Oh my goodness, this is a repeater. You know, what causes the changing spectrum? What could repeat so often? Uh, but, but crucially, when we found a repeater that enabled a localization. And, and I'll just quickly, before talking about the localization, mention we've since observed thousands of events from, from, from this source. And they have all sorts of funky shapes. And um, we often see this downward drifting where the um, highest radio frequencies arrive first. We call it the sad trombone effect because it goes wah, wah, wah. And we don't know why, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's fairly common. It turns out it's fairly common in repeating FRBs. Um, so this repetition, it opened the question, you know, different classes, could there be different classes of FRBs? Some are cataclysmic, some are not. And what could the repeater be? Um, you know, now it harks back to what I started talking about earlier. Could this be uh, a really bright radio pulse showing giant pulses? And in fact, the crab pulsar does show giant pulses. But, you know, it, it, crab pulsar emits 10 to the 38 ergs per second. Um, and only, only a relative, like something like a, a hundredth of that is in the radio. Um, the energetics are really tough for a source at a gigaparsec. Uh, you you would need that spin down luminosity to be cranked up really high. You need a millisecond period, an incredibly high B field. Uh, and yet you'd also need a long lifetime because we've now seen the repeater, that Arecibo repeater over and over and over again. It's not something, it's, it's you know, it's now five years we've been seeing it. So could it be magnetar giant flares? Uh, maybe, and I'm going to come back to that. But first, let me talk about the localization of FRB 121102, the first repeater. This was then, we could ask for time at the Jansky Very Large Array because we knew where to point and we just had to be patient. The source wasn't so cooperative at first. In the fall 2015, we observed for 10 hours, got no detection. 2016, 40 hours, no detection. And I think the VLA time allocation committee was getting pretty sick of us by that time, but they... We've persisted and they said, okay, one last time. And then in the first hour of a test observation in fall 2016, boom, we detected the source. Um, here are the error circles from Arecibo. And if you, you can't quite see it there, but that is the position of the fast radio burst, uh, right as expected. The dispersion measure was exactly the same as Arecibo had measured. We knew we had the same source. And that then localized it to um, an arc second 
which allowed us to go um, to the um, Gemini telescope, the Gemini eight meter optical telescope, where we expected to see a nice big galaxy there. Um, and to our amazement, uh, this was this is the optical Im image, really uh, surprising, a tiny little dwarf galaxy. Uh, this was a big surprise also. It was a tiny dwarf galaxy, but it was a redshift point too. And so that confirmed the cosmological distance that we, as we had inferred all along from the dispersion measure. And so that was exciting. And then using the European VLBI network and the US VLBA, uh, we could detect the source and show that it's in a star formation uh, knot, which suggests youth. And um, that oh, started to smell again like a magnetar, because remember magnetars are very young. Um, this plot here just shows uh, with the VLA, we detected a coincidence radio continuum source that's variable. Uh, we don't know what that is, but I'm just mentioning it to be uh, complete. Uh, when we localized it, uh, we got a lot of fanfare. Um, here's the New York Times, um, which said the radio burst is traced to a faraway galaxy, but the caller is probably ordinary physics, which I found kind of offensive. You know, I thought we should take this source, take a FRB over to the home of that science writer and explode it in the middle of the night and see how ordinary he finds it. Uh, meanwhile, the New York Post talked about aliens. I'm not gonna go there. We do um, not think these are aliens. Vicki, um, I don't know if you can see the, the private chat, but we've got a question from the audience. Oh, oh excellent, yes. yes. Let's see. Um, Hi, Fiona. Probably missed the explanation, but how do you know the changing signal wasn't due to a change in the beam? Is it just because the interval between, be, oh, the change in the telescope beam, you mean? Because the telescope was tracking. Uh, Arecibo was tracking the source, so the, the position with res of the source with respect to the beam was not changing. I hope that answers your question, Fiona. Um, please, everybody, don't hesitate to ask more questions. I, 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 and but do flag me, Dave, when, when somebody does, because my screen is blocking the chat. Okay, so since that localization, there's now been many more. Well, another roughly 14 have been localized. Here's a here's six localized with the ASCAP telescope in Australia, the Australia Australian Telescope SKA Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder Telescope. These are dishes. Um, uh, in the outback in Australia that have fields of view that allow them to detect, uh, you know, s many per year, I don't know, s s uh, something like a dozen per year, uh, but they can localize them simultaneously. And so here is a smattering. And, and interestingly, um, all of the ASCAP uh, uh, FRBs that have been localized today are in massive galaxies. So the fact that the very first one was in a dwarf seems to have been a bit of a a red herring. Although uh, I should point out all of these are uh, non-repeaters. You see here's one in a beautiful spiral galaxy. And they're all at cosmological redshifts. You see point, redshift point 0.5, redshift point 0.3, etc. cetera. Um, by the way, the ASCAP team could do a wonderful thing. Once they had this, this nice sample um, of localized FRBs and redshifts, they could plot the cosmic dispersion measure, by that they mean the dispersion measure after you subtract off the Milky Way, Halo, and ISM components. Of course, they don't know the host galaxy component for these. You, you, you could see the host galaxy and you can try and estimate it, but it, it's, it's tricky uh, to do that. But what they find if they plot that cosmic DM versus redshift is um, uh, a correlation as expected uh, if indeed the um, dispersion measure is proportional to you know redshift as as IGM models predict, and in fact this black line is the Planck model for um, uh, the um, uh, baryonic component of the IGM, uh, which is known to be uh, fully ionized. Uh, so that has actually been quite an interesting um, thing to study because the baryonic component has, has always been is unobserved. Uh, we, we know it's there, it has to be there, but it's been very hard to observe and it's been called the missing baryon problem, even though nobody really thought they were missing. But the point is here, you can now effectively see the missing baryons. You can, uh, and you can show, uh, the ASCAP team has shown 
very plausibly that they've identified the missing baryons. The gray zone, of course, you know, there's large scale structure. So it's, it's not quite as, as simple. You, you expect deviations from the simple model. Um, and uh, I, I don't think this is 100% the last word on this, but I think it, it definitely highlights the potential of FRBs as novel probes of large scale structure. And you'll be seeing a lot more of this con kind of science in the, in the years to come. Um, and indeed, to do it, you need more FRBs. There's no, no doubt about it. You need it not just, you know, to do that kind of um, cosmology and to study large scale structure, but you want to determine their nature. You want to know, do, do all of them repeat? You know, maybe if you just wait long enough, every single FRB is going to repeat. Um, you know, they're all over the sky and you would like more of them, but it's hard for traditional radio telescopes to detect them. Um, you need a very wide field of view. You need, if, you're, if it's a transient phenomenon, uh, you don't know where or when these events are going to go off. You need a telescope that can see everywhere all the time. And that's really hard. But we've given it a shot. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the uh, but CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And the title right away should tell you this telescope was designed for totally different purposes. It was designed for a cosmological experiment to measure redshifted neutral hydrogen. But it turns out its design, and yes, this is a radio telescope you're looking at, is great for transients as well. So this CHIME consists of these four cylinders there, it's located in Penticton, British Columbia at the Dominion Radio Astronomical Astrophysical Observatory. So these are four 20 meter by 100 meter cylinders. So the total collecting area is in Canadian units, about five hockey arenas. Um, these cylinders are oriented north-south. So it's exactly north-south and the sky rotates east-west overhead. It's a transit telescope and has no moving parts. So we observe whatever is directly overhead and we can see the entire northern sky every single day. Along the axis of each of these cylinders are 256 dual polarization feeds, uh, sensitive in the frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. Um, this telescope effectively gives us a field of view of 220 square degrees on the sky, which is uh, orders of magnitude greater than um, conventional radio telescopes like the Parkes telescope or, um, or certainly than Arecibo did. Um, this is the CHIME team. You can see uh, members of our steering committee and uh, we have, uh, in addition to them, we have a small project off, small but incredibly intrepid and wonderful project office. It does great work. And about 60 students and postdocs who work extremely hard on this experiment, you can see um, part of our group, it's not the whole group, uh, standing in front of CHIME for scale and, and then standing in the axis as well. The way CHIME works is that uh, it has a, a massive uh, digital correlator. It's an FX style correlator. So you have the cylinders and all the inputs, they come in at 13 terabits a second and uh, they are correlated and the signals are sent to three different experiments simultaneously. The cosmology experiment that I'm not talking about today, the CHIME FRB experiment, the fast radio burst experiment, which is a trigger experiment. We can't save all the data we, that we collect. We are observing and detecting FRBs in real time and saving only the data that contains an FRB. That's, that's actually uh, important for understanding how CHIME works. Uh, we also have a CHIME pulsar experiment that is observing 10 positions on the sky 24 seven. So all this is happening at the same time, thanks to this amazing uh, digital correlator that was built um, by my colleague at McGill, Matt Dobbs and, um, and Keith Vanderland at the University of Toronto. Now, when you have these antennas, uh, when you have these cylinders, if you put one antenna, basically it focuses in the east-west direction, but not in the north-south. So you see a large swath on the sky, uh, north-south. And then if you populate it with a bunch of antennas, you can, you can think of it as like a, a diffraction grating, or you could, and we can analyze it with a FFT to have um, equally as many independent beams on the sky. And so each of these is a different position on the sky, all within the primary beam due to the cylinder. And then if you populate all the cylinders, you can also get directionality. You can get independent beams in the east-west direction. So basically you get, in our case, we have 1,024 antennas. So you get 1,024 beams. And this is really what it looks like. They're so small. And this is a beautiful diagram 
produced by uh, postdoc Cherry Ng and um, then postdoc Kiyo Masui, who's now um, uh, assistant professor at MIT. And you can see, uh, now you can see the digital beams. Uh, each one of these is searched independently for fast radio bursts in real time. It's like having a thousand Parkes telescopes all operating at the same time. So it's a massive computational effort. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into the detection pipeline because I could talk your ear off about it, but uh, it was basically written by students and postdocs, um, fantastic um, team uh, under the watchful eye of a great project office. And the, all the computing is in these little white buildings little white, there's shipping containers on the side of the telescope. You can see them there. Uh, we detected our first events uh, all the way down to 400 megahertz. That was the first. We, didn't, we weren't sure we were gonna see these things, see events in our, in our beam. Um, and um, since we detected our first 13 events, we've been detecting lots of, this is a chart that shows you how many FRBs uh, were known up until 2019 before Chime turned on. And then when Chime turns on, you see we, we, we can detect them really easily. This is, uh, the telescope is, is fantastic FRB uh, detector. Since we see the full sky every day, um, we can find lots of repeaters. We can, with the sky comes back every single day and we're always watching. So first we published another eight, eight repeaters on the sky and we noticed they started to have interesting complex morphologies, not unlike the first repeater. Um, we see the downward frequency drift, the sad trombone effect commonly in repeaters. We then found nine more repeaters. We published those two. We found lots more. We're, we're working on a paper right now with, with uh, uh, lots more. Um, so that was, uh, that was interesting. And then you could start to do statistics with repeaters. Just looking at my time, I have a few minutes left, I think. Um, you can plot the widths of the different bursts here, these were the first, uh, you don't see the first 13 non-repeaters because one of those first 13 ten, turned out to be a repeater. But you see the widths of the first 12 all fall within this one narrow bin, whereas the widths of the repeater bursts are really, you know, they, 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 they extend quite a ways out. Uh, so this is quite interesting. It, you, you know, the bursts from repeaters and from non-repeaters do have different sorts of flavors. And as I'll explain shortly, um, we've now confirmed that with our first catalog uh, of, FR, of over 500 FRBs, but this was the first hint of it. You know, it could suggest possibly different emission mechanisms, or perhaps there's some sort of, oh, yes. Uh, there's a question and actually related to this. Um, oh, anonymous, is there a link between uh, type of FRB, repeating multi-peaked single burst, and morphology type of galaxy uh, that's localized? Uh, yeah, yeah, what a, what a great question. Um, currently, I don't think we can say that. So this is the sort of thing we would like to know. There's just not that many localized is the problem. So I'll show you. There's another one. There's another repeater localized, and it's, it's localized in a in a spiral uh, in a spiral galaxy. Uh, there's a third one also localized, but it's localized. I hate to tell you this, but in a globular cluster. <laughs> like it's what? Like how could that be? So. Um, Right now, that's I think you're asking a, an excellent question, but there isn't a clear answer to it. it, it but time will tell us. I'll explain. We're, we're going to know the answer. We will know the answer to that question. Um, I'll just mention one of our repeaters uh, is periodic. So this is quite a shock to us. It shows a 16.3 day periodicity in a four day activity window. So we only ever see it in the four day activity window every 16 days. So these complicated plots here, I apologize, but it, it is a lot of data to show. Uh, this is now date or time on the x-axis many months. And this is showing you the exposure. The black line is times when we had full exposure to, this to the repeater's position on the sky. So you see we have lots and lots of exposure, but the red arrows are the only times we detect bursts. So you see, they always fall in. And this ended, I see, in 2019. The, the pattern is, oops, sorry, the pattern is absolutely continued. You could see here a periodogram of the source where the 16-day periodicity really sticks out. And, and these are periodograms of others, of just other random sources just to look and, and nothing else shows that kind of periodicity in our data set. Um, 
that source was then localized with the EVN, um, Mark Code et al. localized it to the spiral galaxy and then using uh, and got a, a nice milli arc second position. And then using Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we were able to show that it sits just outside this far star formation region. So the tip of the green arrow is where the FRB is, the tip. It's definitely outside the star formation region. So it's young, but not that young. So again, it's, you know, the magnetar, you say, well, I guess it's possible you could have a very young magnetar that's snuck outside somehow. We're not really sure. But the big result, another big result from CHIME uh, came not long afterward. Uh, we detected a very luminous radio burst from a Milky Way magnetar now, from a galactic source. Um, not what we were expecting, not what we planned, but we detected it. Uh, a, a known Milky Way magnetar, SGR 1935 plus 2154, had an enormous radio burst. This was also detected, detected by the STAIR-2 collaboration. Um, and we detected two, two really, really bright bursts. It just lit up our whole telescope. So many beams and chime lit up with this source. Incredibly luminous. And, and now this is a really important plot. This is now distance on the x-axis and observed fluence, observed fluence on the y-axis. And so here are the radio pulsars in our galaxy. You can see the crab has giant pulses, that's why it's on this line. And previously there was a radio detected magnetar uh, that sat around here. But when we discovered this source, um, suddenly the observed, this was the, by far the, you know, you see several orders of magnitude greater fluence than had ever been seen from a galactic magnetar before. And, um, or for any radio burst <laughs> in our galaxy. Um, and now these are the FRBs. So you see they're much larger distances. Um, the fluences generally, you know, are, are, are not, you know, they're, they're not enormous, uh, but they imply large luminosities. And so that's what these diagonal lines are. These are lines of constant energy. And so the point is that there was always this energy gap between what galactic radio pulsars or magnetars in the radio showed compared to what FRBs emit. There's this huge gap, but now you have this source. So this new um, incredibly luminous radio burst uh, now sits very close to the energy of the least energetic fast radio bursts that have been seen. So if you had taken this SGR and put it in a nearby galaxy, it would look just like an FRB. Um, so a yeah. question from the audience? Oh, yes. Um, actually, two questions. A yeah. um, question from John Fairweather. Has there been any input by the FAST telescope? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, FAST is done, doing great, great work. Okay. Um, FAST, you know, it's, it, so uh, uh, it has tremendous sensitivity. So its, its strength is uh, not going to be finding hundreds, of, finding hundreds of new FRBs, but its strength is studying repeaters where it, when it knows where to point. Um, it's going to be able to do really detailed studies of individual repeating sources and, you know, study their luminosity functions, study their repeat rates, um, study, you know, do burst morphological statistics, all sorts of things. Fast is gonna is gonna clean up on um, on no on sources. So I think like Chime and 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 Fast together is just a nice partnership because we can publish all our repeaters and they could study them all. Um, the second question is um, from David Turner. Have you done an archival search for X-ray sources at the positions of the FRBs in your catalog? Uh, no idea if an X-ray analysis uh, would give you anything, but he thought he'd ask. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for the question. Yeah. So for the first repeater, definitely. And then uh, the first for FRB 121102, we did. But the, the X-ray emission that you would expect from magnetar is utterly undetectable at, at the distance of FRB 121102. Um, the periodic repeater is much closer. It's 150 megaparsecs away. And, and again, Schultz et al., Paul Schultz, uh, did exactly that study and again, detected no X-rays. Uh, and then it starts to get a little bit constraining. Um, and I'm about to tell you about a really nearby FRB we've, we've published recently where um, we, uh, that, that is underway now. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and the results aren't are clear. But um, so thank if it, Was there one other question in the chat? Uh, yes, there's one other question. Are there any, uh, we could save this for the end, but are there any proposed formation mechanisms for magnetars? Why are they not uh, neutron stars or pulsars or just regular neutron stars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the formation mechanisms for magnetars, at least conventionally, we think of them as born in supernova explosions. And that's because all the galactic, or not all, but many of the galactic magnetars that we know of are inside supernova remnants, are at the centers of supernova remnants. So it's like, oh, that's pretty clear. Um, moreover, the galactic magnetars we know of are all really close to the galactic plane or right in the galactic plane. Their scale height is really small. And uh, you know, it's comparable to scale height of, of uh, you know, dense molecular clouds. And so that strongly suggests it's a very young population. But there are models out there that can form magnetars from say double white dwarf mergers or neutrons, possibly even neutron star, neutron star mergers. So, so yeah, there are papers in the literature that, that have predicted that, but um, uh, you know, in, in some types of uh, gamma ray bursts where uh, they um, will invoke a magnetar as a central engine, those gamma ray bursts might be found on the outskirts of a galaxy, in which case you would definitely want to have the magnetar form through not, you know, a core collapse. Uh, supernova. And as I'm about to tell you, the one magnetar now that is coincident with a globular cluster, well, you know, if you want it to be a magnetar, you gotta, you, you'll need some other formation mechanism like that. These are all great questions, like, uh, so maybe I should move on. But I guess the main point I just want to make with this plot, the last point I want to make, is that the luminosity gap is is largely bridged at least to the faint end of FRBs of FRBs, um, but note there's still six to nine, six to eight orders of magnitude in luminosity to bridge. So we could say they're all magnetars, okay, um, but you know you you really need uh, to bridge quite a, a range of luminosity still, uh, and moreover, remember repeaters and non-repeaters seem to have different burst shapes and 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 as I say, burst spectra. I'll come to that. Um, okay, I, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna have to whip through this last bit, which is which is a shame because it's it's really interesting. But I encourage you to, to look at our paper; it's online on the archive. Our the first Chime FRB catalog of 535 events. It includes 61 bursts from 18 repeaters, um, and I just I'll emphasize it's been a tremendous calibration challenge. Um, gives new appreciation to circular apertures, frankly. Uh, but the team has really, really worked hard on this. And it's the same team developing, maintaining, debugging, operating the telescope as analyzing the data. It's working really hard and um, we're really proud of this. Um, one of the sources in the catalog is a, is a nearby repeating FRB. Actually, it might not even be in the catalog. This might be a separate one. I, I apologize. I, I think my slide got out of order. But in any case, I'll just mention this. A nearby FRB um, only 3.6 megaparsecs away in the spiral galaxy M81. So this is the optical image. This is the localization region just from CHIME alone, from CHIME. We, we also save baseband data. I didn't have time to talk about this, but uh, you can read about in Michili at all. We can localize using raw voltage data that we save upon a trigger. And in the optical image, it's quite a ways off from the optical galaxy, but it's well within the H1 disk. That's what this image is here. Uh, very small chance probability of uh, these these being unrelated. Uh, and it allows a good target for X-ray follow-up, as it was asked. And very recently, thanks to European VLBI network, Kirsten et al. showed that they uh, detected a burst from the source and localized it to a globular cluster in the M81 system. Um, we also have our main catalog results, which from those 500 events, uh, we can now measure the log N log S relation or the cumulative flu fluence distribution power law index. And we get um, minus 1.4 plus or minus uh, these uncertainties. This is uh, very carefully um, uh, measured using a full injection analysis to quantify all of our detection biases. This power law index is consistent with a non-evolving population Euclidean space. And you might say, wait, that's not cosmological, but um, the Chime FRB sample is consistent with the peak being at a distant uh, at a DM of about 500, which corresponds to a redshift of about 0.5. That's the peak, uh, and so soon we we should be starting to. And there's even hints if you read the paper that we've already uh, seen some cosmological evolution in the population. 
We've measured a very precise sky rate, and we have evidence for a large population of highly scattered undetected events in our band. Uh, our band of 400 to 800 megahertz, we, we don't detect all of them, and we think we're missing a lot of scattered ones. Um, I've run out of time, so I just very quickly, I'm gonna advertise some of the first catalog analysis papers. In addition to the catalog paper, there's multiple papers coming out at the same time. Um, Plurinus et al. compares FRBs with non-repeaters in, in both, both morphology and spectra, and the conclusion is very clearly they're very different. Both the morphology, the burst widths are wider in repeaters, and the spectra are narrower in repeaters. Um, Joseph et al. does an analysis to see if there's any correlation with the galactic plane. You, you might expect if there's some contamination from galactic sources or, or previously there were some suggestions you might have different rates in and out of the plane just due to scintillation effects. We don't see anything like that. It is, there's no correlation with the galactic plane in our catalog. Um, uh, Masood Rafier Ravandi has done a correlation of the catalog with large scale structure using a variety of different galaxy catalogs and concludes, yes, there is some, some correlation in the redshift range 0.3 to 0.5. And there's a couple more papers in preparation that you'll be hearing about soon. The, these first three are already out of the archive. These will be very soon. Um, since I've run out of time, I'm gonna skip those slides and just very quickly say, we will soon be building outrigger telescopes for CHIME uh, to localize these things better. So we can't localize most of our FRBs, but we are building three different outrigger, smaller versions of CHIME funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And we hope in the next year, well, year or two to be localizing over a thousand FRBs to 50 milli arc seconds. Um, and that's very exciting. We're, we're looking forward to that. And with that, I will stop. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Vicki. It's amazing to see how far things have come in, in just a few years. Um, uh, I remember being there when you guys were sort of getting, getting the back ends all set up uh, and uh, not having detected stuff yet. So it's very cool. Um, right, so we have time for a few questions um, from Ashley. What would, uh, Ashley uh, Crimes, what would you, uh, yeah. What would be your guess for the origin of the periodicity seen in some repeaters? Orbital period, precession, something else? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so the, the three possibilities are, I mean, to me, to me, it has looked a little bit like an orbit all along, but there's some recent, um, recent data that argue against that, and that's uh, that the LOFAR has detected bursts from that repeater. This is in two separate papers, one by Plonis et al. and the other one, I, I don't quite quite remember, but I know it's Yuri van Leeuwen's team. Um, and what's interesting there is that the LOFAR bursts, they also follow the periodicity, but they come later in the activity window. In fact, they they're just later in phase than the higher and higher frequency bursts. And so that is a little hard to understand in a binary model. It's also a little harder to understand, I think, in a, well, maybe not in a procession model. I know, um, I think I've, I've heard an interesting talk by Dong Zi Li, who has some ideas about how to account for that. There's also the slow magnetar possibility that there's a 16 day rotation period. That seems a little harder. I, I've ha I have heard an interesting uh, talks about that, but it might be a little harder to, to get. I'm, I'm not yet convinced by that, but um, I think the jury's still out, but it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question about, um, do you find that the alien argument from newspapers overshadows the research you've done? Uh, I wouldn't say it overshadows it in the sense that I think um, people are super interested in hearing about FRBs, partly because they wonder if they could be alien signals. So I wouldn't say it, it overshadows it. I do think it's important to uh, acknowledge the enormous evidence that that's a natural phenomenon and, and that um, it, it's, there's no need. I mean, yes, we don't yet know what they are, but we're on the hunt. We're making progress. We're, you know, the every lots of fields you didn't know what they were until you studied them. Um, so I don't 
I don't feel compelled in any way to to think that they are aliens, but I I don't. Yeah, I also yeah, I gotta keep an open mind, I suppose. Yep. Um, last question from uh, Keith Horn. Any prospect of fast optical emission from these? Yeah, so so people are looking for it. There's a team at the Subaru Telescope who's working, um, observing the chime field. Um, I know there's other teams also trying to do this. Uh, I think Meerkat, I, I didn't, uh, Meerkat's also doing some, some great work and um, uh, I believe they have an optical telescope that's also trying to do this. So far, it hasn't been seen and, um, you know, there, there's, there, there are model predictions where you, you might see it, but there's also models that say it'll be really hard to see. I think x-rays is probably more likely to start with, but, um, but it's worth a shot for sure. Yeah. Okay, and that brings us to our time. Um, thank you so much, Vicki. That was very interesting, and it's uh, always great to see you. Um, and for everyone else, uh, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, enjoy your sessions uh, in the afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>